Now let us turn our attention to the development of excess pore pressures during the earthquake shaking. Estimating the buildup of excess pore pressures during the shaking in an equivalent linear analysis is based on the idea of a cyclic stress ratio, a CSR. The concept is based on determining the number of cycles at a particular cyclic shear stress amplitude required to cause liquefaction. Here is the definition of a cyclic stress ratio. The cyclic stress ratio is defined as a ratio of the dynamic shear stress divided by the static effective overburden stress. Q sub D is the dynamic deviatoric stress. If you recall from a triaxial test that if we have a test like this, that sigma 1 minus sigma 1 minus sigma 3 is the deviatoric stress. So half of the deviatoric stress is a measure of the shear stress. So we have here the deviatoric stress divided by 2 is a measure of the shear stress, and we normalize this shear stress with respect to the effective overburden stress and this is multiplied by a factor of 0 0.65 and the reason for that is we'll see in just a minute. So this has to be related we then, uh, sorry, backing up a bit the cyclic stress ratio is determined for the uh, dynamic analysis, and then this has to be correlated with laboratory tests. And so from laboratory tests, we get the number of cycles that are required to cause liquefaction at a per particular shear stress ratio level. So for example, a shear stress ratio, cyclic stress ratio of 0 0.2 for this particular soil would require 10 cycles to cause liquefaction. If the stress ratio was 0 0.25, it would take a merely some, just a couple of cycles to cause liquefaction. However, if the shear stress ratio was 0 0.15, it would take at least 100 cycles to cause liquefaction. So this is a log scale, so the number of cycles to cause liquefaction, of course, changes very, very dramatically with changes in shear stress ratio. So this is a user-defined piece of information for Quake W, and we call it the cyclic number function. And this is dependent a material property that needs to be defined in a quake dynamic analysis. So that is the laboratory test. The difficulty is that a field shaking results in an irregular shaking or an irregular horizontal shear stresses. The shear stresses go up and down during the actual earthquake in the field. In the laboratory, however, we have a uniform cycles. Usually we have uniform cycles. And so the question becomes, how do we use our laboratory uniform cycles as a, something that we can relate to the irregular cycles in the field? So let us assume that we have an earthquake magnitude of 7 and that 
at a particular point, let us say a, a particular finite element, the horizontal shear stress, the peak value is 1230 pounds per square foot. For, this would then, for example, come from Quake W. And then we need to rely on this empirical chart and I refer you to Professor Steve Kramer's book on page 370. Uh, this graph is taken from his textbook. And what this graph is saying, that an earthquake of magnitude 7, of magnitude 7, for the mean data would produce approximately 10 cycles where the shear stress amplitude is 0 0.65 times the peak value. So let me repeat that. So if we had an earthquake magnitude of 7, it would take 10 cycles, uniform cycles, of an amplitude of 0 0.65 times the peak shear stress. So therefore, we had a peak value of 1230. Multiplying it times 0.65 gives us a shear stress amplitude of 800 pounds per square foot. So the earthquake of magnitude 7, with its irregular shaking, with a peak shear stress level of 12 something, will produce an equivalent of t it will produce an equivalent of 10 uniform cycles with an amplitude of 800 pounds per square foot. So here is our amplitude of 800 pounds per square foot, and we have 10 cycles. This is the procedure that is used to relate the field irregular cycles to the laboratory testing uniform cycles. So therefore, now we know that the earthquake will produce 10 uniform cycles. And so if we had a shear stress ratio of 0.2, it would take 10 cycles to cause liquefaction and the earthquake causes 10 cycles. Therefore, we would have a liquefaction, which says then the number of cycles to cause liquefaction is 10 divided by 10 is equal to 1. Therefore, our pore pressure ratio here is 1. If the shear stress ratio was some larger number, it would take say five cycles, and so we would have 10 divided by five is equal to two, which is greater than one. Therefore, the soil would have liquefied and the pore pressure ratio would be 1.0. Now, if we had a lower shear stress ratio, say 0.15 and we had a thousand cycles required, then the earthquake will produce 10 divided by a thousand that are required at that shear stress level. This is 0 0.1 and we would then come in here and say our pore pressure ratio is approximately 0 0.1. And so we look at this ratio here of the actual number of cycles divided by the number of cycles required 
to cause liquefaction at a particular shear stress level, and we determine a pore pressure ratio here, R sub U. So with R sub U defined now, the pore pressure is computed from the above equation. And so we now have R sub U, and we relate it to the effective minor principle stress sigma 3 prime under static conditions. So once again, the thinking is that when the pore pressure is equal to the effective confining stress under static conditions, the soil will liquefy. This is worth repeating. It is the static stresses, so we have to go back to the stresses before the shaking started to get the minor principal stress times now knowing R sub U, we can get the change in the pour water pressure. Or in other words, saying it another way, it gives us the excess pressure. So in our illustrative example that we are going through, we are now going to define a cyclic number function and show you how to do that. And for this particular case here, we are going to select a cyclic number function for medium loose sand. So let us go back to GeoStudio and define these pour water pressure functions. So we go into our key in materials. Number one, the dam embankment, we say that the pour water pressure function and the cyclic number function is none. What we are saying thereby is that there will be no pore pressure generated by the shaking in the dam embankment, uh, embankment material. The same with the superficial crust and in the granular drain material. The foundation, however, that is the loose sand, we now need to say something about the cyclic number function and the pore water pressure function. If we click on this button with the dot, 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 well, I've already defined a cyclic number function. And once again, Quake W gives you some sample function and means of estimating this curve. So we click on the estimate button. And in this case, we want to select, we want to select a medium loose sand function. And so here is our cyclic number function. Now having defined the function, we need to now attach that function to the soil. And so we select our cyclic number function. And we need a pore water pressure function. And a pore water pressure function, we usually accept the default function here. It is possible to alter this function a little bit, but usually there isn't sufficient data to alter it a great deal. And so we accept the default settings for the pore water pressure ratio function. Once again, we need to attach it to the soil. So we select from the list pore water pressure function. Now at this stage, I would like to illustrate a point, and this will become clear as we go along, but for the time being, click on key in materials, selecting the foundation soil. We want to make sure that we uncheck use, we want to uncheck use steady straight strength when liquefied. First of all, we're going to do it with this unchecked and then later on we will go and check this and interpret the difference and the meaning of when we use this option here. So for the time being we will uncheck 
this uh, option here, use steady state strength when liquefied. Also, there are some other correction factors here, which I won't take any time to explain, but uh, they are set to none at this particular case here. One other thing, going into key in analyses under convergence, let us set the maximum number of iterations to five. And now if we click on verify, it appears that we have supplied all the necessary information and we can now click on solve and solve the dynamic part of the analysis. Just to make sure we should also recompute at this stage our initial conditions. So if I hold down the control key I can recompute my initial conditions and then I will compute the Quake W dynamic analysis. Clicking on start then it recomputes the initial conditions and now we are computing and solving for the dynamic analysis. So we've gone through the earthquake record once, now we're on the earthquake record two t the second time, the third time, and now the fourth time. and now the fifth time and notice that it is now going quite a bit slower because after we have found all of our peak values and established our material properties at this final time we go through the earthquake record one more time and write the data to file which usually takes a lot of time. So now we have completed the Quake W dynamic analysis.